Welcome to the first lecture for the Spring 2024 List 3100 Critical Thinking and Problem Solving course. I'm your course instructor, Dr. Lewis Rabinowitz, but feel free to call me Dr. Lou or just Lou. We have a full agenda for this lecture, beginning with the housekeeping items of introducing ourselves to each other and making sure that we cover the syllabus in a comprehensive manner. I assume some of you, maybe many of you, or even all of you have had a general psychology course. Even so, we're going to spend some time reviewing items that might already you might already be familiar with, but we'll focus on certain schools of psychological thought and how they might inform one's approach to problem solving and the nexus of psychology and critical thinking. The four, four schools of thought we'll discuss tonight include operant and classical conditioning, social learning theory, gestalt, and humanistic psychology. Before moving on though, let's talk a bit about some of the advantages and challenges of a fully asynchronous course. First, of course, is that the lectures are recorded. The advantage of recorded lectures are that they can be viewed and stopped at any time for a break. They can be viewed as many times as desired, and they can be viewed at students' convenience. But remember, they must be viewed. Perhaps the biggest disadvantage is that there is no immediate interaction with the instructor or classmates, and of course, no immediate answers to questions. Unless the instructor contacts an individual student or vice versa, there is little or no live interaction. However, I want to be very clear that I will be available by email, text, phone, or in-person meeting if you need to discuss an issue or simply want answers to questions concerning course content. Be assured that I can make myself available to meet students at a convenient time. I do not have a tech office, but can meet at the Oak Ridge campus of Roan State or the Pellissippi State main campus in Knoxville. If you're not local to either of these places, we can find an alternative place to meet or maybe do a Zoom call or, uh, or a FaceTime, something like that. Allow me to spend a few minutes to introduce myself. As I said, my name is Dr. Lewis Rabinowitz. I hold a bachelor's degree in education, a master's in psychology, and a doctorate in technological and adult education with a cognate of industrial organizational psychology. I was raised in Johnstown, a small Pennsylvania town about 60 miles east of Pittsburgh that has a population about the size of Oak Ridge. I wrestled in high school and was fortunate enough to earn a scholarship to St. Francis College in Pennsylvania, where I studied elementary education. After graduating college, I moved to South, where I earned a master's degree in psychology at West Georgia College. West Georgia, by the way, is one of the few psych programs in the U.S. that has a humanistic orientation. Once I finished my master's program, I moved to Knoxville, where I met my late wife. After living in Oak Ridge for about 12 years, I returned to school and earned my doctorate in technological and adult education with a cognate in industrial organizational psychology. Work-wise, my early career was spent in special education, counseling, and social services, working with groups ranging in age from three years old to 60 years old. I've been doing consulting in the human resources field for most of the past 30 plus years with a three year stint from 20, uh, 2009 to 2012, working as the director of workforce programs for Roan State. Now it's your turn. Your first homework assignment is to tell me about you. Specifically, tell me uh, your name, what has motivated you to pursue, pursue your degree, what your tech major is, a little bit about your current work, if you currently have a job, and a bit about your outside interests. Do you like hiking, baking, painting? Do you have a family? Do you spend most of your time with your family? That sort of thing. I just want to get to know a little bit more about you. That way I can uh, perhaps give examples that uh, are uh, specific to your situations and that sort of thing. Now, in order for you to do your in, uh, introductions, 
please do the following. Send a short email. It only has to have the bare details, the bare essentials that are outlined in this current slide, uh, and send that email to me and also to your fellow classmates so that they get to know you a little bit better as well. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about the syllabus. First of all, here's my contact information. So if you do need to send me an email message or call me or text me, uh, that information is on this slide. My preference is for you to send email messages to both my tech address and my work email address. There's two reasons for that. One is I have in fact been having a little bit of difficulty uh, with the tech email. Um, I think we've got it all straightened out, but if you send the message to both email addresses, chances are uh, much better that I'll get it. Um, and the other reason, the second reason why I ask you to send it to both locations is because I only check my tech email about twice a day, two or maybe three times a day, but I check my uh, work email constantly. Um, so um, if you have a, a, an urgent message to send me, obviously the, the work email is the one to send it to um, all the time because I'm, I'm uh, as I said, I, I check that email many, many times throughout the day. Let's talk about office hours. Office hours are by appointment. Uh, I have no assigned uh, tech office. Uh, I live in Oak Ridge. In fact, I live uh, very close to the Oak Ridge campus, only about uh, the Oak Ridge campus of Roan State Community College, uh, only about a mile away from, from there. Um, obviously, I live pretty close to the Pellissippi State Community College campus on uh, Pellissippi Parkway in Knoxville. It's only about 12 miles from where I live. So um, because I have no office, uh, I could meet at either of those places, uh, perhaps in the cafeteria or a class, an empty classroom or something like that. Uh, glad to do it. Uh, we just have to find a convenient time. Uh, for both of us to, to meet at, uh, at either the campus uh, location in Oak Ridge or the one at, at Pellissippi State. Um, if, if those locations are not convenient to you, uh, perhaps we can uh, schedule a Zoom call or a FaceTime call, something like that, and, and meet that way. Uh, but certainly feel free to contact me via email, text, or phone to schedule an appointment. The textbook that you'll be using is The Power of Critical Thinking by the author Lewis Vaughn. This textbook, I think, is, is a very good textbook. Uh, it has great examples. Um, it covers the uh, topic of critical thinking in a, in a very clear and concise way. All that being said, however, I think you'll find the information that we're going to cover in the psychology of problem solving course a little bit more familiar to you, especially if you've already had a general psych course. Um, the critical thinking uh, part of the course is a little um, new to most people I found as I've taught this course over the past several years. Uh, and because of that, it's particularly important for you to read the assignments in the textbook. You're not gonna be assigned all of the chapters, but the chapters that are your, you're assigned are going to be some pretty heavy duty chapters uh, that you're gonna have to uh, read in order to understand the information in this course. The purpose of the course is for you, the students, to be introduced to critical thinking and the psychology of problem solving. You'll participate in activities and assignments to supplement reading assignments and lecture materials. Course objectives and student learning outcomes. At the conclusion of the course, you should be able to articulate why both algorithms and heuristics are fundamental to effective problem solving. Uh, you may not know uh, those terms, algorithms and heuristics. We're going to cover those uh, a little bit later in the course, um, but they're not really difficult terms to understand. Um, but they are uh, very, very important when it comes to uh, knowing about uh, how 
to solve problems and the approaches that we take to solving problems. A second objective in student learning outcome is for you to be able to demonstrate an understanding of why problem solving is a creative process. We often think of problem solving as a burden, but in actuality, it takes a lot of our creative juices to solve problems. And the more you learn about um, formal ways of solving problems that give you some um, frameworks to use, I think you'll see how problem solving is actually uh, considered a creative process. You'll be able to demonstrate an ability to engage effectively in discussions and formulate an effective argument to support beliefs formed using a critical thinking approach. Arguments are the coin of the realm of critical thinking. And arguments are, when we talk about arguments and critical thinking, we're not talking about the kinds of little uh, bug tussles that people get into when they're angry with each other or anything like that. What we're talking about is the ability to to create, formulate uh, logical uh, arguments, arguments that have a, a, a specific format that you're going to learn in the critical thinking portion of the course. And finally, the last major objective, not all of the objectives in the course, but the last major one that we're going to aspire to is for you to be able to demonstrate the ability to critically evaluate your arguments as well as others' arguments. It's important that you know that when you critically think about a point that somebody's making, even if that someone is you, that it holds water. We have to be able to evaluate, to be able to assess our own arguments as well as other people's arguments to determine whether they're robust, whether they really hold water, so to speak. And the only way to do that is through a formal evaluation process that you're going to learn in this course. Here are some of the major topics we'll cover in the course. Tonight, we'll spend most of our time reviewing approaches to understanding the psychology of humans. Next week, we'll get into the psychological context of problem solving, and uh, we'll talk about various problem solving techniques. We'll talk about basic concepts of critical thinking, and we'll talk about the nexus of problem solving and critical thinking. In other words, how does problem solving inform critical thinking and what critical thinking skills do we apply to problem solving? We'll discuss in a future lecture obstacles to critical thinking, and we'll talk about making sense of arguments. That topic of making sense of arguments is going to take uh, some of our time because that's where we parse out and evaluate arguments to determine whether they're robust arguments or um, faulty arguments. And finally, the last major topic we'll discover is fallacies and persuaders. Fallacies and per persuaders are faulty arguments that people make. Um, we see a lot of examples of uh, fallacies and persuaders in things like advertising and, and commercials, or when somebody's trying to get us to do something uh, they may use a faulty argument to get us to do something that we might not ordinarily want to do. And right now, with the November elections coming up in 2024, uh, listening to a lot of uh, politicians and, and looking at their uh, political ads are going to give us a lot of opportunities to uh, find fallacies and persuaders. And uh, I don't want us to get into uh, discussions of whether it's better to be a liberal or a conservative or a Republican or a Democrat or, or, or an independent. Um, we're not going to discuss politics at that level. However, I will tell you this. If, you, if you're very honest in your approach to looking for fallacies and, and persuaders in arguments, you'll find that it doesn't matter whether it's a Democrat or Republican making the argument. Uh, or whether it's a liberal or a conservative or an independent making the argument. Um, people in all of those categories uh, tend to, uh, not all people in those categories, but there, 
or many people in all of those uh, political categories that use faulty arguments to to get uh, you to to uh, agree to their point. I know as students, this is a topic that you're very interested in, the grading scale. The grading scale, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, in this chart. Um, to earn a, a letter grade of A, you'll have to score between 90 and 100% of all of your assignments and, and uh, exams. You're gonna have one uh, major exam at the end of the term, uh, a final exam, but you're going to have at least two um, quizzes, uh, two graded quizzes. I might give you a third grade, a third quiz that's not graded, just as as a, a practice quiz. Um, but you'll have to score between 90 and 100 uh, percent cumulatively in in all of your assignments and all of your exams and quizzes to earn an A. Likewise, to earn a B you'll have to score between 80 and 89.9% for a C, 70 to 79.9% for a D, 60 to 69.9%. If you score be below 59.9%, um, you'll get a, you'll receive a grade of F. Here's the attendance policy. Uh, you should read this attendance policy, but the bottom line is this. Um, this is an asynchronous course. There are no scheduled class meetings. Uh, the only way for me to tell whether or not you're attending, so to speak, is for me to look at the iLearn system and see if you've looked at the videos or not. Um, if you've missed the video completely, if you skip it, you're gonna lose a letter grade. In other words, if you earn 100% on all of your exams and quizzes and and assignments and you'd ordinarily get an A if you totally skip one of the lecture videos you'll get a B if you skip two lecture videos you'll get an F I consider those skippings uh, as unexcused absences um, Here's a, a little bit of detail about the academic honesty policy of Tennessee Tech. Very important that you that you know that for all of your courses, not just this course. Uh, if I catch anybody cheating on one of the quizzes or exams, um, that uh, that is a very serious violation of the TTU uh, academic honesty policy. Uh, we're not going to have any written papers per se in this course, but there may be some uh, short, uh, short answer essays, and you might have to uh, reference uh, a book or article uh, from a journal or magazine. Uh, if, if that's the case, if you reference uh, a journal article or a book or anything like that, I expect you to annotate that uh, and, and, and uh, give credit where credit is due. Um, Plagiarism is a very serious uh, issue. You may be familiar that, or know that the uh, president of Harvard University uh, resigned uh, recently because it was found that she uh, plagiarized a part of her, uh, she plagiarized somebody else's work uh, to put in part of her uh, doctoral research uh, and she lost her job over it. Um, so plagiarism is very serious. Cell phone use, that, that's not going to come into play in this course because it is an asynchronous course. Uh, if this were a, a class that I was teaching uh, live in, uh, or uh, even via Zoom, uh, this cell, cell phone use policy would come into play in my class. Obviously, if you get a cell phone call while you're watching my video, my lecture video, and you want to take that call, you can stop the video and take the call and then come back. So the cell phone use uh, issue is not, not a big one here. Before I cover this last topic, uh, I want to be clear that I haven't covered the entire syllabus, so please read the syllabus when you have the opportunity. Disability accommodation. If you happen to be a student with a disability, here is the information, uh, here is some information that might be helpful for you. Um, as far as my class is concerned, um, 
it's entirely up to you whether or not you want to uh, inform me uh, if you have a disability. Um, however, if you do have a disability and there's anything at all that I can do uh, in terms of perhaps even um, larger text on 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 my uh, on my PowerPoint slides or or anything like that, um, just send me a uh, an email and let me know how I might be able to accommodate your disability uh, to make it a little easier for you to uh, move through the course. Obviously, again, because this is an asynchronous course, we're going to do things a little bit differently than we might do in a face-to-face -face classroom course or even a Zoom course. One of the things uh, that you can do differently is to take a break at any time. Just stop the video, take as long of a break as you need, and come back. However, if you're going to sit down and watch the video all the way through in one sitting, this might be a good time for you to take a 10-minute break. Uh, and, and then return for the rest of the lecture. Video links. Throughout the course, you'll view two types of videos. In addition to the class lecture video you are viewing now and others you will view in the following weeks, I will introduce additional YouTube videos that will support important contextual information in the lecture material. We'll refer to these as contextual videos moving forward to avoid confusing them with the lecture videos. When you are ready to view a contextual video linked in the lecture video, please follow these steps. Pause the lecture video and open the Word file titled List 3100 OT2 Spring 2024 Class Meeting 1 contextual videos. Click on the appropriate link for the contextual video you want to view. The contextual video will begin in YouTube and you should now see tabs in the menu bar of your web browser for both the contextual video you are currently viewing and another for the lecture video. Once you've finished viewing the contextual video or videos, close the tab for the video you've just watched. Finally, click on the tab for the lecture video to return to hear the rest of the class lecture. Now let's talk about the psychology of problem solving, specifically part one, a psychology refresher. First, while rooted in older disciplines such as philosophy and medicine, you have to understand that the field of psychology is relatively young. It pales in comparison to fields such as mathematics and engineering. A German scientist, Wilhelm Wundt, is known as the father of psychology. And psychology wasn't born until he opened the Institute for Experimental Psychology at the University of Leipzig in 1879. To put it in perspective, psychology did not come into being until after the American Civil War. The father of psychology actually died only two years before my father was born. As mentioned, one of the disciplines that informed psychology was philosophy. By steering the study of the mind toward a more scientific approach, he is credited with separating it from philosophy. Wundt stressed objective measurement and control as being important to the discipline. I want to highlight four schools of thought uh, in psychology that inform the study of problem solving either by contribution or omission. And you'll uh, be more clear on what I mean by contribution or omission as we move forward. The next big name in psychology is a fellow named Ivan Pavlov. Pavlov was a Russian neurologist and physiologist. You may sometimes hear other folks refer to him as Ivan Pavlov. And in fact, you're gonna see a video uh, shortly in which the narrator refers to him as Ivan, but uh, the correct pronunciation in Russian is Ivan Pavlov. Uh, anyway, he made a very important discovery that helped accelerate the study of the mind quite by accident. 
Pavlov was experimenting using dogs as subjects. He was trying to learn more about how the dogs digested their food. To do so, he cut holes in the dog's stomach to observe digestion. As you may know, the first stage of digestion occurs when one takes a bite of food and begins to chew it and break it down for further processing by the body. When a person or dog or other animals take a bite of food, salivation is increased in the mouth, again as an aid to digestion. This salivation occurs automatically, naturally. What Pavlov discovered was that the, his dogs would begin salivating even before they had food in their mouths. It turns out that the dogs were fed at about the same time by Pavlov's assistance each day, and the dogs would begin, begin salivating when they heard the footsteps of the assistants. We would expect the dogs to salivate to the stimulus of food, but Pavlov discovered that they also did so to the sound of the footsteps. The food was what is now known as an unconditioned stimulus. Salivating when food is in the dog's or human's mouth is an automatic physiological response now known as an unconditioned response. What Pavlov discovered is that responses can be learned or conditioned. The footsteps of Pavlov's aides as they carried food to the dogs was a conditioned response. They learned that when they heard footsteps, food was coming, and that was enough to cause the salivation. Pavlov did other, other experiments where he elicited the conditioned salivation using a bell and a music box. Please stop this video now and open the Word document titled List 3100 Spring 2024 Class 1 Contextual Video Links and click on the link to the video titled Psych 104 Week 3 Classical Conditioning Pavlov. While I suggest watching the videos when you come across a link in the presentation, you also have the option of watching all of them at your convenience. Pavlov's discovery of this unconscious or automatic learning is now known as classical conditioning. <clears throat> so what do salivating dogs have to do with human psychology? Well, Pavlov's initial serendipitous discovery ultimately led to important concepts that are still in play in some counseling and therapeutic environments. Pavlov knew that giving food to his dogs was a stimulus that created the response of salivation. But why would dogs salivate when they heard footsteps? Today's behavioral psychologists, those who put the findings of Pavlov's and others into practice that we'll discuss in a few minutes, would say that the dogs learned that footsteps meant food. A stimulus then is something that triggers an action. An action triggered by a stimulus is known as a response, but there are differences between a naturally occurring phenomenon of dogs salivating when food is introduced and the phenomenon of salivating to, well, as it turns out, any stimulus a researcher might use. This has led to distinguish between unconditioned stimuli, such as food in Pavlov's work, and conditioned stimuli, such as noises in Pavlov's studies. To illustrate, let's think about an athlete, say a long distance runner. During their off season, they may not exercise as much as during their active season. Starting out a new season, their heart, lungs, and muscles are unconditioned. For the runner to be able to be competitive, he or she has to train or condi condition their heart, lungs, and muscles to prepare for races. In a sense, the usual or natural state of the runner's body is his or her unconditioned body. When the runner's body is trained for racing, it has been conditioned. The sound of footsteps, bells, and a music box would not have caused the dogs to involuntarily salivate until those sounds were paired with the dog's food multiple times. Something like hearing the assistant's footsteps that ordinarily would not result in an action is called a neutral stimulus. The footsteps only became a conditioned stimulus after being paired with the dog's feeding times. So what do salivating dogs have to do with human psychology? Well, Pavlov's initial serendipitous discovery had ultimately led to, an import, to important concepts that are still in play in some counseling and therapeutic environments. Pavlov knew that giving food to his dogs was a stimulus that created the response of salivation. But why would dogs salivate when they heard footsteps? 
today's behavioral psychologists, those who have put the findings of Pavlov and others into practice that we'll discuss in a few minutes, would say that the dogs learned the footsteps meant food. A stimulus then is something that triggers an action. An action triggered by a stimulus is known as a response. But there are differences between a naturally occurring phenomenon of dogs salivating when food is introduced and the phenomenon of salivating to well, as it turns out, any stimulus a researcher might use. This has led to distinguish between unconditioned stimuli, such as food in Pavlov's work, and conditioned stimuli, such as noises in Pavlov's studies. To illustrate, let's think about an athlete, say a long distance runner. During their off season, they may not exercise as much as during their active season. Starting out a new season, their heart, lungs, and muscles are unconditioned. For the runner to be able to be competitive, he or she has to train or condition their heart, lungs, and muscles to prepare for races. In a sense, the usual or natural state of the runner's body is his or her unconditioned body. When the runner's body is trained for racing, it has been conditioned. Another individual important to our discussion of classical and operant conditioning is J.B. Watson. Watson's early life was chaotic. His father left the family to live with two women when Watson was quite young. His devoutly religious mother moved the family to North Carolina where she hoped that her son would grow up to be a preacher. Watson ultimately rebelled against his upbringing and became an atheist. He completed college and received his doctorate from the University of Chicago, where he remained for five years to do additional research. He was then hired by Johns Hopkins University and was immediately named head of the psychology department. He became known as the father of behaviorism and is considered one of the most influential behaviorists of the early 20th century. Watson, a married man with children, engaged in an affair with Rosalie Rayner, his assistant, whom he married after his divorce. He was asked to leave Johns Hopkins and then applied his behaviorist ideas to a new career in advertising. He is credited with coming up with the slogan, good to the last drop for an advertising campaign for Maxwell House Coffee. Watson was famous for saying, give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed and my own specified world to bring them up in and I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. If you have ever seen the movie, The Boys from Brazil, in which young boys are trained to be Nazis, Watson's quote seems quite frightening. He is also famous for a study he did with a baby known as the Little Albert or Baby Albert experiments, in which he demonstrated how he could condition certain types of emotional reactions from a baby. Now please stop this video, open the Word document with the conceptual video list and click on the links to view the videos J.B. Watson, Little Albert to learn more about that famous experiment and to, uh, that actually features Watson and Rayner and James Garner for Polaroid 1981 that features Mariette Hartley, Watson's granddaughter. Watson's granddaughter, Mariette Hartley, by the way, claims that her psychological problems are a result of the stern uh, behaviorist upbringing that he got as a result of his uh, her grandfather's uh, concepts. Watson downplayed the role of consciousness. Most behaviorists like Watson downplay the role of consciousness and they stress the importance of the environment on shaping our behavior. Um, Watson was influenced uh, not only by Pavlov, uh, Ivan pa Ivan Pavlov, but uh, by the uh, researcher Robert Yerkes, who studied primates uh, and the behavior of, of the great apes. Um, Yerkes is quite famous. He had the uh, what's called the Yerkes Primate Lab. I think the Yerkes Primate Lab is still in operation, uh, although obviously uh, Dr. Yerkes uh, passed away in 1956. Watson's contributions to psychology, which were honored with a medal from the American Psychological Association, can be seen as transitional between the classical conditioning of Pavlov and the operant conditioning of B.F. Skinner. It was Skinner, in fact, who coined the term operant conditioning. While Watson is known as the father of behaviorism, Skinner is known as the father of behavior modification. 
There are similarities between classical and operant conditioning. Both result in what behaviorists would say is learning. However, the processes are different. Classical conditioning involves pairing a previously neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus that results in a conditioned stimulus and conditioned response. Skinner applied and refined the tenets of cl classical conditioning into what has become a pragmatic application of the concepts to what is now known as operant conditioning. Operant conditioning uses a system of reinforcement to either increase or decrease a behavior. Thereby, an association is formed between the behavior and the consequences of that behavior. A reinforcement is any stimulus that increases the probability of a response. The two main types of reinforcement in this domain are positive and negative reinforcement. Positive reinforcement involves adding a reward or removing a punishment. Negative reinforcement is taking away a reward or punishment. Many people tend to confuse the term negative reinforcement with punishment because we typically think of punishment as something negative. So please review these definitions to be sure that you know the differences. Skinner developed the Skinner Box, a contraption to study animals interacting with their environment. For instance, he would put a rat in the box and observe how it would move around until accidentally stepping on a lever that released some food pellets. After accidentally stepping on the lever multiple times and receiving the uh, positive reinforcement of the pellets, the rat would ultimately learn that when hungry to step on the pellet. Skinner also used pigeons in some of his studies where they were conditioned to peck a disc with certain words to get food. While the pigeons did not learn how to read, they did recognize differences between the characters and the words and ultimately learned when and when not to peck for food. You'll see this in one of the upcoming videos. Skinner's studies convinced him that some form of reinforcement is necessary for learning to take place. In another video, you'll see Skinner's concepts applied to an environment for young incarcerated men with behavioral issues. To underscore the differences between classical and operant conditioning, please click on the link to the video titled Classical versus Operant Conditioning in the Class 1 Contextual Video Links Word document. To view a video demonstrating Skinner's use of a device to shape and reinforce the behavior of pigeons, click on the link to the video titled BF Skinner, Operant Conditioning and Free Will. Finally, Let's watch something kind of fun, a video from an episode of the Big Bang Theory called Positive Reinforcement, the Big Bang Theory, in which the character Leonard applies operant conditioning techniques. Caution, there's an error in how the Big Bang video refers to negative reinforcement. Can you spot the error? The first student to send me an email message with the correct answer will receive a bonus point they can use to make up for any incorrect answer to a quiz question. The next school of thought we'll look at is social learning theory. This school of thought has some similarities to behaviorism, but places more emphasis on modeling or observing the behavior of others than it does on the environment as behaviorists do. Researchers like Albert Bandura, Canadian American psychologist, who is perhaps the most recognized social learning theorist, would say that we are very much influenced and acquire attitudes, emotional responses, and new styles of conduct through filmed and television modeling. However, unlike Watson, Skinner, and other behaviorists, social learning theorists would say we don't merely respond to stimuli in our environment, we have the capability and natural inclination to interpret what is going on in our environment. In other words, it's not just monkey see, monkey do. Now please view the following videos by clicking on the links in the video Word document. The first of the three videos, Albert Bandura, Social Cognitive Theory and Vicarious Learning, describes how Albert Bandura found that clients he was working with who had a fear of snakes, seemed to become a bit less comfortable just by observing others with that fear handle snakes. The second video, Social Learning Theory, shows short examples of social learning theory in action. 
And the third, called Children See, uses short snippets as cautionary tales for how not to act around children, as, according to social learning theorists, theorists they may pick up on negative behaviors as an undesirable consequence. Now might be a good time for a break if you desire. The third school of thought we'll visit today is the Gestalt school. The German word Gestalt means unified whole. The psychological theory is based on theories of visual perception developed and advanced by such psychologists as Max Wertheimer, Kurt Kafka, and Wolfgang Kohler, who wanted to understand how we make sense of our chaotic surroundings. The concepts gained traction as a pushback to behaviorism, and in my view, is, was a precursor to the final school of thought we'll investigate, humanistic psychology. Gestaltists, as part of their pushback on behaviorisms, believe there is more to learning than a simple response to stimuli. They contend that cognitive processing leads to the whole is greater than some of its parts. In other words, human psychology must be viewed holistically and not in the reductionist manner that behaviorists view humanists. The Gestaltists claim that humans tend to group elements, recognize patterns, and simplify complex imagery through the five principles appearing on the next slide. The Gestalt principles include the following. The principle of proximity tells us that there's a tendency to perceive elements as a group when they're close to each other. Similarity is the tendency to group items that look like each other. The principle of continuity tells us there's a tendency for us to follow paths and group elements aligned with each other. Closure is the tendency to fill in gaps or connect dots to complete implied shapes or images. And finally, connectedness is the tendency to group elements that are connected to each other. The example of proximity on this slide shows three sections of a quiz. According to this Gestalt principle, we would tend to group the items in the area labeled one and recognize it to be a heading. We would then group the elements uh, in area two, the words, uh, as a question on the quiz. And we naturally group the items in the area three as possible answers to the question. For our example of similarity, we see a bunch of M and M, &M, &M candy pieces. I don't know about you, but I used to literally put the various colors of M&Ms into actual pals by color when I was a kid. I'd always eat the red ones last. While my obsession with M&Ms might be an interesting case study in psychology, the point is we have a natural tendency to group similar items, if not literally, subconsciously in our mind. Continuity is the tendency to follow paths and group elements aligned with each other. The photo here of a plant leaf, or maybe it's a flower petal, is a good example. We immediately recognize the group lines that are also leading lines that tend to make us follow them to the center of the image. As an amateur photographer, I've learned that leading lines are a compositional tool that many photographers employ to get viewers to focus on where in the photograph they want them to pay attention to. Closure is the tendency to fill in gaps or connect dots to complete implied shapes or images. Here we see a great example. The image of the leopard is not bound by a line surrounding all of the black spots, but we don't see the image as a collection of multiple dots and, and random spot, splotches, but rather we see a carnivorous feline. In our example of connectedness, we see the small circle and small square as one group and the large circle and square as a different group. Apparently, the Gestalt principle of connectedness trumps the principle of similarity. The final school of psychological thought we'll look at today is humanistic psychology. Two of the seminal leaders of this branch of psychology were Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. Rogers came up with the concept of client-centered therapy. While it can be argued that all psychological therapy may be considered client-centered, what Rogers meant by the term is that the client should be the individual in the therapeutic settle, setting who discovers their underlying ways of existing. It is not so much the therapist's job to diagnose and treat as it is to guide and support as the client engages in self-discovery. 
As you'll see in the following video, the therapist seems almost passive as opposed to the more probing approach a psychoanalyst might be, uh, take. Abraham Maslow is credited with defining the third fourth force of psychology as humanistic psychology after the first two forces of behaviorism and psychoanalysis. He is perhaps most famous for his pyramid-shaped hierarchy of needs, which demonstrates that individuals aspire to move through a series of stages that ultimately lead to what Maslow characterized as self-actualization, becoming a fully formed human, human being in all aspects. Humanism tends to be view, uh, tends to view the individual holistically to include not only the individual's behavior, but their physical and spiritual components as well in a way that the Gestaltists alluded to when they stated the sum is greater than the whole of its parts. The three essential characteristics of humanistic psychology are the centrality of human experience, holistic models, again, the influence of Gestalt, and a value-based and value-affirming approach to ourselves and others. Please now use the links in the Word video document to view the videos titled Carl Rogers on Person-Centered Therapy and Why Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs Matters. The first lecture covered four schools of thought in the field of psychology, operant and classical conditioning, or the behaviorist school, social learning theory, Gestalt and humanistic psychology. Of these four schools, which resonates with you and why? Type a response to this question and post it in the discussion area before next Monday, March 18th at 11.59 p.m. Your response should be concise, but should still be comprehensive enough to get your point across. Perhaps the equivalent of a one-page double-spaced type paper. As part of your assignment, you must also comment on at least two of your classmates' responses to this question. Tell your classmates whether you agree with them or not and why. Remember, be kind. Your responses to your classmates' responses should be courteous and non-confrontational. This assignment is worth five points out of the 100 points total your final grade will be based on. Please do not hesitate to contact me with any questions or concerns you might have. Uh, you can reach me by phone or text at 865-805-0632. I prefer texts. Uh, sometimes I'm in a meeting, uh, uh, etc. So I prefer a text uh, so I'm not interrupted. But uh, certainly, uh, if you have an emergency, give me a phone call. Um, certainly after 5 p.m. Eastern time, uh, that's fair game for a phone call too. Uh, I'm usually done working my day job by 5 p.m. So you can feel free to call me after 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, likewise, uh, I get up pretty early. Uh, you can call me or text me uh, after 7 a.m. Eastern time, 8 a.m. Central time. Uh, but please no later than 9 p.m. Eastern time or 8 a.m. Central time. I go to bed early, get up early. And my tech email is checked two to three times a day. Um, and that address is lrabinowitz at 10tech.edu. Uh, if you need a quicker response, it's always better to email me or text me. My work email uh, is checked uh, quite often and it's checked hour, at least hourly. Uh, that email address is lou at lorconsultancy.com. Uh, class dismissed. <laughs>